Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Gil Klein. I'm the president of the club and a national correspondent for media general newspapers, writing for the Richmond Times-Dispatch, the Tampa Tribune, and the Winston-Salem Journal. In deference to full disclosure, and in light of our speaker, I should add that Media General also holds the cable franchises in Fairfax County and uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Not that that should do anything about uh, what you say here. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome the club members in the audience today, as well as those of you watching us on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Before introducing our head table guests, I would like to remind you of some of our upcoming speakers. On Wednesday, May 4th, Howard Baker, former senator and chief of staff to President Reagan, will discuss U.S. companies doing business in the former Soviet Union in a speech entitled, The New Russian Revolution. Uh, on uh, Wednesday, May 11th, Senator Bill Bradley, Democrat from New Jersey, will talk about violence in America. And on Thursday, May 12th, Kim Dae-jung, uh, South Korean elder statesman, will present a speech entitled, The Road to Asian Democracy, North Korea, Asia, Asian Trade, and Other Issues. Transcripts and audio and videotapes of this luncheon are available by calling 1-800-500-9911. If you have any questions for our speaker, and I certainly trust that you will, please write them on the cards provided for you at your tables and pass them up, and I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask, ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. Please withhold your applause until all the names are read. From your right is Lou Perlman, a freelance journal and author of Schools Out, a book about the multimedia revolution. Next to him is John Alden, associate editor of Telecommunications Reports. Al Warren, editor and publisher, Warren Publishing. Janine Aversa of the Associated Press. <laughs> and her husband out in the audience there. Uh, Brian Lamb, uh, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of C-SPAN. Mary Crowley, Executive Editor, Education Technology News. Blair Levin, Chief of Staff to Mr. Hunt. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, we have Christy Wise, freelance journalist and chairwoman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Karen Watson, director of the Office of Public Affairs at the Federal Communications Commission. Ken DeLecky, editor of Kiplinger's Florida Business Letter and the member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Uh, Mark Lewin of Business Week. Uh, Kim McAvoy, uh, Washington Bureau Chief for Broadcasting and Cable Magazine. And finally, Ted Hearn, Washington Bureau Chief of Multi-Channel News. Now you can applaud. <clears throat> also, I'd like to thank staff members Melissa Bender, Pat Thornsbury, Melanie Abdow-Dermont, and Jeff Tarbell for organizing today's luncheon. Now, until recently, we might have introduced our speaker today, Mr. Reed Hunt, as the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. But now, at the dawn of the age of interactive communications, we call him the top cop on the inter information superhighway. There are those who compare what's going on in the communications business with the Louisiana Purchase or the great post-Civil War railroad expansion. Vast new territories are opening up and billions of dollars can be made. The FCC stands as the gatekeeper of a wide array of rapidly changing technologies, broadcasting, cable television, cellular and conventional telephone, satellite and microwave transmission. Mr. Hunt has already made it clear that he is not going to take a passive role. His first major initiative was to order cable television rates cut by 7%. Consumer advocates lauded the action, but critics said it crippled the cable industry's ability to raise money to build the information superhighway. In the wake of his decision, Bell Atlantic's $26 billion merger with telecommunications collapsed. But whether this, there was a cause and effect is debatable. 
Mr. Hunt's FCC has levied heavy fines for offensive language by shock jock Howard Stern, and he defends the agency's right to regulate broadcast content if it's deemed to be in the public interest. That worries some defenders of the First Amendment. Before coming to this job, Mr. Hunt built a successful communications law practice in Washington and Los Angeles that certainly may have warranted his appointment. But Mr. Hunt also had an uncanny ability to make the right friends at an early age. <laughs> he and a guy named Al Gore became buddies at St. Albans Prep School here in Washington, and the two of them went to a Beatles concert. Later, at Yale Law School, he got to know a fellow from Arkansas named McClinton. When the president credited uh, Chairman Hunt with getting him through admiralty law, Mr. Hunt reportedly responded, it wasn't just admiralty law. <laughs> <laughs> he says he may be the only person who contributed both to both the uh, Al Gore's first congressional race and Bill Clinton's first gubernatorial contest. But Mr. Hunt's true contribution, me, Mr. Hunt's true contribution to journalism lies in another chance encounter at an early age. As editor of a Yale student newspaper in 1968, he discovered a cartoonist and talked his colleagues into waiving the rules to allow him to begin his strip called Bull Tales. Today, that strip is known as Doonesbury, and its creator, Gary Trudeau, is perhaps the biggest name in political cartooning. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm press club welcome for Mr. Reed Hunt, chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, and a good guy to know. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, uh, Gil, for that uh, very nice introduction. Uh, an awful lot of it was true. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ken Delecki and Christy uh, Wise, for inviting me here. Uh, when I uh, grew up a long, long time ago in Falls Church, Virginia, uh, my mother used to tell me about the great doings across the river uh, within such edifices as the National Press Club, where the reporters of our country uh, told us what was happening and helped shape what was happening, and it truly is a pleasure to be invited here today. <clears throat> I am uh, here today to talk to you about one of the great events of our history, the development of the information highway. I will try to explain today why I favor vigorous competition as the way to build that highway, and I will explain why I hope we all agree to adopt three key principles as the framework for that competition choice, opportunity, and fairness. At the outset, I'd like to talk about what the information highway is. Never have so many talked so much about something so hard to describe. The biggest problem for me in discussing the information highway is that you can't see it. It is made up of invisible pulses traveling through cables underground. It is energy waves across the sky in Gertrude Stein's famous phrase, there is no there there. And most of it will, what it will deliver to people is like the intriguing plants I like to order from the gardening catalogs in our long, long winters, not yet in stock. Another difficulty is that the term information highway is used to describe more than one thing. Let me discuss some of the meanings of the term. First, information highway surely refers to our country's great familiar parallel communications networks. These are the telephone system that reaches 98% of all homes. These are the cable system that passes more than 90% of homes. The broadcast TV and radio stations that provide free programming to everyone. The cellular telephone system that covers most of the country. And the satellites that soon will offer video programming on dishes no bigger than a large salad bowl. Second, the information highway is everything involving communications, from long distance calls to VCR tapes, on which the average American household now spends almost $2,000 a year. This amount has doubled in the past 10 years. It continues to rise every year as our appetite for communications, whether voice, video, or data, continues to grow. 
third the information highway is what almost two thirds of all americans travel on as they do their daily work police and school teachers homemakers and stock brokers sales clerks and even newspaper reporters depend on cheap information and easy communication to be productive and successful fourth the information highway represents the gateway to our country's future prosperity when a computer programmer in massachusetts dreams of developing educational software for kids in public schools she's counting on the information highway when a graphics designer wants to use a computer to dazzle hollywood studio executives he needs the information highway to reach his video database when a construction worker is hired to string fiber optic cable through Manhattan to introduce competition in telephone service, he or she is building the information highway. The current edition of U.S. News and World Report lists 25 breakthroughs that are changing the way we live and work. Each, each and every one, from paperless manufacturing to voice recognition, is part of the information highway. Each is going to create a new job or make an old job more challenging, more productive, and ultimately more highly paid. Fifth and finally, the term information highway refers to the technological marvels and investment opportunities associated with two extraordinary developments, convergence and interactivity. Convergence means that each of the parallel networks that I mentioned before can deliver products and services that compete with the products and services delivered by the other networks. Now this convergence comes from inventions like fiber optics, sonnet rings, digitization, compression. Here's the good news, we do not need to understand all the technology. We do need to appreciate that the technology can make each network capable of delivering voice, video, and data. And after the needed investments in each network are made, these networks can compete. Broadband interactivity is the other extraordinary development. Broadband interactivity means two-way communication of full motion video pictures, data, and voice back and forth across all the networks. Instead of the TV delivering a signal just one way, interactivity means two-way communication. That is particularly appealing for someone like me who occasionally talks to the TV, especially during Redskins games. And the term broadband means that a telephone, already a two-way communication, will not be limited to voice. Instead, it can include two-way video. When you sign off by saying, see you later, it will be literally true. But what is most important about convergence and interactivity is not so much any particular application that they permit. It is that these developments in our networks give us the opportunity to encourage competition in delivering communications. Vigorous, robust competition is characteristic of our great industries in this country. The computer industry, for example, has generated great economic growth and tremendous productivity gains through cutthroat competition. But we have only skimpy experience with full competition in communications markets. We can get a sense of what is possible by reviewing what happened when AT&T lost its monopoly over long distance telephone services 10 years ago. MCI, Sprint, and now 400 other long distance companies have entered that market. Rates for long-distance calls have dropped by two-thirds. AT&T has continually lost market share, but because of higher demand coming from lower prices, AT&T has increased its revenue. Just as with long-distance phone service, we can expect a similar entrepreneurial explosion when competition comes to local telephone service and cable TV. As companies compete in these businesses, hiring people, buying everything from equipment to programming, competition will, as competition has always done in our country, lower prices, improve service and value, and stimulate economic growth. 
Not only has invention given us the opportunity to introduce competition in existing communications markets, now dominated by a single or at the most a couple of suppliers, but also the information highway can give us competition in markets that are just beginning to be developed, markets we are just beginning to imagine. Soon companies will be competing to offer you a connection to a two-way voice, video, and data network that will let you visit a doctor, deposit and withdraw in your bank account, play games with people in distant, distant cities, have your children do you the homework and electronic mail it into the classroom, all without leaving your home or your workplace. The race to build the interactive networks that can compete to deliver the new goods and services will be fascinating for reporters and the public to watch. But more important, it will generate massive economic growth and hundreds of thousands of new jobs. Because the term information highway has come to encompass the entirety of our communications revolution, the highway metaphor is clearly overstrained. Put aside the highway idea for a moment and join me in focusing on a single key fact. In exploring the full potential of the communications revolution, no other country in the world trusts in private industry and competition to the degree we do. In almost all other countries, governments interfere in the market in many ways with many excuses. For example, the Minister of Telecommunications for one of the former Soviet republics recently told me his country's economy was too poor to permit competition, and therefore he was authorizing monopolies to develop the country's wire and wireless systems. I told him, with respect, that if his country was poor, it was too poor to tolerate monopoly. I said the Soviet Union tried to foster economic growth through state-authorized monopolies, and that didn't turn out so well. Here in the United States, we're blessed with economic strength, and that strength comes from our nation's reliance on competition as the way to promote our economy and increase job growth. But competition means change, and change means risk. That is why, though all praise the principle of competition, when it comes to their own markets, the established incumbents may well resist. For that reason, introducing competition to all aspects of the communications revolution is a lot easier said than done. But it can be done. Competition means permitting new companies to bring local telephone service to your community, as the state of Maryland did just last week in authorizing a new competitor to Bell Atlantic here in the suburbs of Washington. Competition means enabling new companies to provide video programming, just as the Federal Communications Commission did when we decided not to let cable companies lock up programming with exclusive contracts. Competition means finding a way over time to let long distance companies into the local telephone markets and local telephone companies into the long distance markets just as congressional leaders such as Senator Hollings and Congressman Dingell, Brooks, Markey, and Fields are now doing with their proposed legislation with the administration's support. The challenge of competition will be difficult for newcomers and for established companies alike. And in the competition, there will be winners and losers. But the winners won't be able to stay on top for long, and the losers won't be down forever. That's the way it is in a competitive economy. There will also be continuous rethinking of corporate strategies and investment plans. For instance, a year ago, a race between the two wires of the cable and telephone industries was said to be the way to develop the information highway. Then we went through a period where all progress depended on alliances, joint ventures, and proposed mergers between telephone companies and cable companies. And now just today I read in a trade magazine that the telephone and cable companies will separately invest in their competing networks to see if either or neither can be the most important pipeline for the information highway. Meanwhile, the wireless and broadcast and satellite networks each urge their own candidacy for preeminence as the essential network for competing in communications. I do not believe that the public wants government to pick its favorite network for development. 
the public does not want government to choose among different proposals for technological innovation of the networks i agree with the public instead competition should determine who wins our role is to referee the game and as a referee i prefer just as they do in the n b a playoffs to let the players play but let's be clear no one can tell how the competition game will turn out however though we can't predict where communications technology and markets will lead us we can make sure our economy will be the winner as long as we make an unshakable commitment to let private sector competition lead us and the rest of the world through the information age as the framework for this competition I would like to see if we could all agree on three guiding principles choice opportunity and fairness choice will be good for consumers and business but now the communications market does not offer enough choice in most places there is only a single local telephone company and there's almost no choice available for video programming if you want ESPN preferred by my eight-year-old son Nathaniel or if you want cable to improve the quality of the PBS signal for Barney my five-year-old Sarah's favorite show in all but one percent of the country you have just a single cable company with which to subscribe if you don't like their prices or the way they treat you it's take it or leave it now we all know choice means lower prices for consumers and no choice means higher prices for example the average buyer of basic cable service who had no choice in 1983 except just take it or leave it found that 10 years later in 1993 he or she was looking at a bill 240 percent as big it was only the cable act of 1992 that broke the back of those continuing price increases but when there is choice the act will not apply because competition will set the price for cable programming that is what the public prefers and so do I choice is not just good for consumers it's good for business I'd like to tell you a story about a visit I had from several people in North Carolina recently they have a startup company they showed me the circuit board they put together they believe it can greatly expand the use of the telephone system they'd like to contract to put it into the telephone system everywhere so that that network as I mentioned before can carry not just voices but full motion video but right now the people in that small company must negotiate with just a single telephone company in every market they depend in every market on that one company's say so for their very existence choice would mean they could negotiate with more than one company choice would mean they would have a greater role in their own destiny our second guiding principle should be opportunity we must assure that the communications revolution provides all Americans the opportunity to participate dozens of examples of opportunity are at hand to focus on a single one later this year we will sell the rights to run businesses that use the spectrum the airwaves in the summer we will auction so-called narrowband PCS which is the opportunity to run advanced p paging services and PCS stands for personal communication services and toward the end of this year we will begin auctioning broadband PCS that is enough spectrum to permit a company to offer mobile telephone services provided by lightweight low-cost pocket devices we are almost four years ahead of the congressional deadline in getting this auction out and if we do our job right and take the time to do it right analysts estimate competition could generate 100 million wireless telephone subscribers within 10 years that means 84 million more customers than now subscribe to cellular phones all Americans should have the opportunity to participate in this new market selling the services building the systems doing the marketing handling the repairs getting the new jobs the legislation permitting the auctions asked us to make sure that small business women minorities and rural telephone companies would have an opportunity to participate in this grand economic endeavor that's why our very able staff and my fellow commissioners and I are analyzing along with the private sector 
how best to fulfill the congressional mandate to provide this opportunity to all americans another opportunity the communications revolution gives us relates to the forty five million americans who work and play every day in buildings largely cut off from the modern information age these are our children in schools kindergarten through grade twelve in only half the classrooms in the country are their computers and in only four percent of the classrooms are the computers connected to telephone lines only one out of twenty five classrooms has the opportunity to connect to the communications revolution the president of the united states in his state of the union called for us to connect all classrooms libraries and clinics to the networks by the end of the decade many telephone and cable companies have promised to meet this challenge difficult issues of interconnection standard setting and tariffing for schools will have to be debated but if we all agree to ensure opportunity for all americans including especially our children these issues can be resolved the third principle is fairness the competition to build the information highway must be fair no one wants big companies to take unfair advantage of small companies through prohibited exclusive dealing illegal discriminatory pricing or other inappropriate trade tactics competition for the new entrants will be tough enough the incumbents will have to play fair and no one wants to see big companies that dominate markets use their power to charge unfair prices to consumers when those consumers can't go anywhere else for telephone or cable service these basic rules of fairness and competition have long been followed in our capitalist economy they will have to be applied to competition and communications just as they apply in all other sectors of our economy the principles of choice opportunity and fairness form the framework for an unalterable commitment to competition when my oldest son adam now in the sixth grade is looking for a career i do not know for sure if he will find his life work in the communications revolution but i can say that this same revolution has already worked for my family and millions of other americans for the last several generations i'd like to close by telling you about my father and his mother in 1930 living in an apartment in milwaukee wisconsin next to the zoo my father was nine years old then when the windows were left open on summer nights he could hear the elephants trumpet as he went to bed or so he told me then his father died leaving his mother my grandmother not only a widow but unemployed and without skills in the depths of the depression my father's childhood was shaken and his future was imperiled but the communications revolution of that time brought her a job she became a switchboard operator that's how she made ends meet and how she sent her son to college a generation later because of his education and the good job it gave him he was able to give me the fine schooling and the training that i need every bit of to try to do my current job well that communications revolution is still going on in most places it has eliminated the job of switchboard operator but it is constantly creating other jobs instead and if we commit now to vigorous competition and communications guided by the principles of choice opportunity and fairness we will see that another parent gets a job that does not now exist another parent will be able to make ends meet where hope might otherwise not exist another parent will be able to give his or her child a better life and the cycle of progress will continue and the american dream will endure that is what is at stake in communications today and why i'm very lucky to have the chance to contribute to our country thank you i look forward to your questions Thank you very much. We have a few questions here. We, we always need more. If you, this is your one time you can pass up the zinger right here. Uh, first questioner says, uh, the guiding principles you described for developing the information highway 
did not include the one that to date has guided all previous decisions on the U.S. telecommunications industry, protecting the public interest. Could this change in outlook explain the FCC's indifference to ensuring that cable companies uh, re, uh, reacting now to re-regulation by dumping C-SPAN from their systems? Uh, <laughs> okay, could you stop this trend? At the latest count, more than 2.7 million homes have been disconnected from C-SPAN, right? Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> by their cable companies. That's a good question, Brian. <laughs> uh, the three principles that I mentioned, uh, choice um, and fairness and opportunity, are, I think, an interpretation of the public interest as applied to the issues presented uh, to us. Uh, with respect to C-SPAN, with respect to any programming service, uh, the FCC has tried very hard uh, in its recent decision involving cable to provide incentives for investment in new channels so that there would be greater opportunity for programmers to reach their audience. And we're delighted to continue to work with programmers in industry to make sure that those incentives are real and that they work for Americans because there's no question that Americans enjoy what they get over the TV. Uh, they like uh, the idea of being able to subscribe to uh, cable programming, and we want them to be able to get more and more of that programming uh, as they may choose to buy it. This questioner says, if you were the CEO of a company that wants to compete uh, to provide local telephone service, and you face state and local entry barriers, an entrenched monopolist with 99% of the market, and in the case of cable, strict regulation of your core business, what would you ask the FCC to do? Take a little time to read that. This is, of course, the uh, question of the time for many, many businesses in the country. Uh, there are, for example, utilities all over the country that are exploring right now the possibility that they can use the uh, pipelines and other networks that they have to go into the telephone business. Uh, it is not uh, the FCC's role to make these business decisions, but it is our role to make sure that anyone who has a plan for introducing competition in any market uh, will be able to work on that plan uh, in a way that will enhance the possibility of competition. For example, uh, the FCC has, uh, for a number of years now, been in the process of ordering the local telephone companies to open up their businesses so that competition can actually come in by plugging right into the network. So that, for example, the local telephone company has to open the door of its office and permit a potential competitor to come right in and actually connect to the network. Uh, this is an extraordinary step. Uh, it wouldn't be necessary in any business where there was competition. It is necessary to get competition uh, in the local telephone markets. So uh, I believe that we're doing what we can, and we'd like to do even more uh, as it's suggested to us to introduce competition into these markets. This questioner says, tell us about your position on the airwaves or spectrum. Do we as the American public own them and who will look out for our uh, financial interests? Uh, the airwaves are the great public property uh, of the American people. That has always been a key principle uh, that is why the Federal Communications Commission exists in large part, to uh, guard the public interest with respect to the airwaves. However, I think Congress acted very, very wisely in permitting us to auction off use of certain parts of the airwaves so as to give this tremendous business opportunity to the private sector. I'm talking about the business opportunity of PCS or personal communication services. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Gil, the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, that was a tremendous opportunity for all Americans. Uh, there's no question that when Thomas Jefferson agreed to buy uh, that property from France, he didn't know what use would be made of it, and for sure we know France didn't know what use might be able to be made of it. Uh, the key, however, is that government did not decide what use to make of the Louisiana Territory. Uh, it was consistent with the American spirit that we just let people go in there and, in fact, let people come from all over the world and immigrate here to go into that territory and use it to build our country out there. 
And similarly, with respect to the spectrum that we're auctioning here, we're not going to decide what use should be made of it. We're not going to tell people what services that they must uh, provide. We're not going to tell people how to market. Uh, we're not going to tell companies uh, what are the good uh, competition strategies. We're going to say, pay a fair price in an auction, and then go at it. And I think that'll be best for the economy and will be totally consistent with the public interest. How far should the FCC go in regulating broadcast content? Why not let listeners and viewers decide by turning or not turning the dial? This questioner obviously doesn't have an 11-year-old at home with his own ideas of what to watch. Uh, Gil has just answered the question for me. Uh, and up until uh, uh, they're 11, uh, you can have some influence over them. I found that out as my son Adam turned 12. <laughs> Uh, let me say quite seriously that we're not in the censorship business. The Communications Act says we're not supposed to do censorship. We don't do censorship. Uh, there are regulations uh, that permit us to ask broadcasters to uh, channel or to confine certain kinds of broadcasts to hours when the children are not likely to be there. And uh, Gil already had reference to that. What steps will the FCC take to reduce the impact of rate regulation, for example, reduced revenue to cable systems, in order to encourage uh, the launching of new cable networks? Well, of course, uh, the key, the most important thing about rate regulation and cable is that uh, when there is choice in any market, when there's not just one provider but a uh, presence of another provider, then there isn't going to be rate regulation. That's what it says in the statute. That's what it says in our rules. Uh, however, when there is no choice, uh, we have taken steps uh, and we want to uh, continue to take steps to make sure that there are incentives for adding channels and adding services and giving a fair return to both the operator and the programmer on those additional channels. Uh. You made it clear the FCC will help open local markets. What is the FCC willing to do to ensure U.S. companies can enter foreign telecommunications markets, especially as foreign companies seek our lucrative open markets? Uh, this is an extremely important question, and I'm very glad that this issue was raised. The opportunity for uh, economic growth on a worldwide basis in communications uh, may be the greatest opportunity for uh, foreign sales that American business has ever faced. Uh, I had the privilege of representing our country uh, as the telecommunications uh, regulator, along with 179 other counterparts uh, from countries around the world at the first development conference of the International Telecommunications Union in Buenos Aires a couple of months ago. I found there that all the countries in the world have on the drawing boards telecommunications development plans. It was there that I met the, the fellow from the former Soviet Republic that I mentioned in my speech. Uh, what we said there, and the Vice President took the lead for the United States and gave the most memorable speech of its kind ever given at the ITU, what we said there was that the principles of competition and open entry ought to be adopted by all the countries in the world. And if those principles are adopted, then American firms will be able to compete with the firms of other countries in providing telecommunications services to the hundreds of millions of people in the world. There is an unbelievable uh, magnitude to this opportunity. We have in this country 55 telephone lines for every 100 people. In Brazil, there are seven telephone lines for every 100 people. In Africa, there are 0.7 telephone lines for every 100 people. And it is not the case, as it was thought to be, that countries must be rich before they can have a communications service. It is the opposite. They need a communications infrastructure in order to have any prosperity. This is now widely perceived all over the world. And the lending institutions in the developed countries, including those associated with government, are beginning to focus more and more on ways to finance the development of communications infrastructures so as to permit sustainable development to occur all over the world. All of this means opportunity for American business, and we all need to take advantage of that opportunity, particularly those of us in government who have the chance occasionally uh, to do some arguing with our counterparts to make sure they adopt our principles of competition and access. 
not because we just tell them to adopt them, but because they really do work and they really are best for all the people in the world. A lot of questions here about the PCS, the personal uh, communication systems. Uh, you addressed that in your speech, but uh, do you support the three PCS Pioneer Preference Awards and the related loss of revenue to the Treasury? And this question wants to know, is PCS on track? Will you meet the congressional timetable? Uh, with respect to the Pioneer's Preference, I am uh, recused from voting on that and cannot comment on that. Uh, with respect to the timetable, the statute gave uh, the Federal Communications Commission five years uh, within which to conduct the auctions. That fi the first year of the, those five years uh, expires, I think, or approximately September 1. So, as I mentioned, we'll be uh, doing the narrowband auction this summer and beginning the broadband auction toward the end of this year. So we w are way, way ahead of the timetable uh, Congress set. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, that we in any way want to delay or take it slow. Uh, it is very, very important for economic growth to get PCS businesses up and running as soon as possible. So uh, you will find uh, within the next couple of months, uh, I believe, we will finalize our uh, broadband reconsideration and our auction rules for broadband. We've already done that for narrowband. Uh, and then businesses can form their strategies for competing in the auction, which will take place on the schedule I just mentioned. This questioner says, the Postal Rate Commission has a full-time advocate on staff to speak as the voice of the consumer, a public ombudsman. Would this be a change uh, potentially useful to have at the FCC, and would you be willing to endorse something of this nature? Uh, that's an idea that uh, hasn't come to me yet, and I think is very, very uh, uh, much worth considering. Okay, this question says, the jobs and economic growth created by the NII, tell me what the NII is quickly. National <laughs> Information <laughs> Initiative uh, or Nation Infrastructure. Okay, National <laughs> Information Infrastructure will depend in large measure on ensuring that information providers, publishers, newspapers, videos, and music producers, Etc. have strong copyright protection. What is the FCC's role in advancing these protections? Uh, I'm delighted to say that copyright is not, uh, strictly speaking, within our jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> this questioner wants to know, why should the government determine the price I pay for MTV and not the price I pay for Blockbuster Rentals or the price I pay for the ticket at the National Press Club lunch? Well, now, it actually says the price I pay for the Monopoly <laughs> ticket at the National Press Club lunch. Well. And <laughs> it goes on to suggest that viewers need more choice about which press club they would go to. <laughs> uh, the government uh, doesn't determine the price uh, to be paid for any particular channel. That's not the nature of cable regulation. Uh, the regulation concerns um, what are called uh, regulated services, defined as of September of 1992. Uh, the intent of the statute and the intent of our rules is that consumers should pay less if they were buying, if they're buying now exactly the same thing uh, that they were buying in the fall of 1992. But if they're buying more, if they're buying more channels, then they'll pay more, just not nearly as much more as they would pay if the Cable Act had not been passed. What's your view on ensuring access to the information highway for non-commercial educational services like those offered by public broadcasters, schools, and libraries? Uh, as I've already mentioned, I think that the President's challenge to wire all the schools, library, and clinics in this country uh, is a, a wonderful thing for him to have said and a wonderful thing for the various businesses in the country to agree to meet. There's no question that uh, if all the classrooms in the United States are linked to the information highway, it will provide opportunity for education, uh, the opportunity to change our means of educating our children in ways that have never uh, been replicated before. Uh, with respect to uh, the non-commercial educational services more generally, it is our hope that in a world of choice among multiple channels, there will be increased access for not only those particular kinds of programmers, but all kinds of programmers. And that, that in turn will mean much greater 
availability of different services for consumers what will ensure that parts of society traditionally bypassed by new ideas will not suffer the same fate on the highway blacks and hispanics low income people may become the gas jockeys on the sidelines not the drivers of the highway uh, in fact, uh, we have been studying the question of universal service or the extent of our telephone networks and have uh, determined that, as far as we can tell, about one out of every eight African American and one out of every eight Hispanic families in the country does not even have active telephone service. I've been told that in Los Angeles, among Hispanic voters, as much as 22% 20 per of the households do not have active telephone service. Uh, it's not acceptable for these uh, numbers to continue. They are not this high because of any uh, ill will or bad faith on the part of any company. Uh, it is rather the case that we do not yet know how to solve these problems. Uh, the FCC and the telephone companies are working together to develop new techniques for extending universal service, uh, meaning active telephone service at a minimum, to everyone in the country. Now, as the information highway and all the senses that I mentioned in my speech actually is rolled out and the interactive broadband services are available generally to Americans, it will be appropriate over time to have a evolving standard for universal service, not just active phone service, but something beyond that. I think, however, that we do not need to uh, solve this particular problem of defining the evolving standard. Uh, today because we do not yet know what most Americans will regard as useful or appropriate. And what we do need is a commitment that as most Americans reach some kind of consensus about uh, what is necessary to continue to participate fully in our economy, then we will want to continue that consensus in terms of universal service. We will want to make sure that what most Americans think they need for participation in the economy is what we will find a way to make available to all Americans. Uh, how will you get uh, more competition in local residential phone service as opposed to local business service? Well, I think the, uh, for example, the proposal to have a competitor to Bell Atlantic uh, does in fact target uh, residential uh, uh, locales. Furthermore, uh, residences in New York are going to be facing uh, competition at local telephone service. So there are plans uh, on the drawing boards now and getting rolled out to deliver local telephone service competitively to some residences. That doesn't mean that those plans exist for all residences in the United States. That's absolutely right. It may well be that the key to finding competition and choice for local telephone service for everyone in the United States is the same PCS business that I was just talking about. It may well be that it's the wireless phone which will provide an alternative to the wire phone for most Americans at their residences. The business plans that have been shared with us at the FCC indicate that as the PCS business develops and tens of millions of customers are added, the costs will go down precipitously. After all, that's how they're going to get these great penetrations. And as these costs go down over time, it may well be that those costs become competitive with the costs for local residential phone service on the wire system. The essential element, however, is that we must promote from the start competition in wireless. We never did that on wire telephones. We didn't from the start make a commitment to competition within the wire network. Now we have a chance to write on a blank slate almost, and we can write the word competition up there and get lots of providers out so that they can race to develop the lowest possible cost structures, get the greatest penetration, the greatest number of subscribers, and constantly force price down to marginal cost, down to the lowest possible levels. What role will local governments have in the information superhighway? Uh, local governments. Um, uh, have uh, a major role. For example, it is local franchisors that have the responsibility for regulating the basic cable package that I mentioned in my speech. It is local governments who should have a major role in implementing the uh, challenge of the president to connect all the classrooms to the network. 
it is local governments who should as the concept of universal service evolves tell everyone what really are the needs in their individual communities local governments should not in any sense be left out or should not feel left out but rather they should participate vigorously in the information highway meaning all the senses of the word that I mentioned will the information how well first of all can you tell us a little bit about uh, pending legislation on Capitol Hill affecting uh, the information highway and will it unfold will the information highway unfold if the if this legislation does not pass well the information uh, highway in uh, its multiple senses is inevitable uh, it would be possible for uh, it to be slowed if we make the wrong decisions uh, I think a right decision would be to pass uh, from the different bills that are presented by Senator Hollings and Congressman Brooks and Dingell and Markey and Fields. It would be possible quite readily uh, to craft a bill that should become law that would be uh, a tremendous enabler of the information highway. I very, very much hope that this happens. Now, Senator Dole has been critical of uh the FCC. Can you tell us a little bit about what his problems are and how you respond? <laughs> I'm uh, only had this job for five months, but I don't think I'm supposed to speak for Senator okay. Dole uh, in this job. Uh, well, whoever passed up that question, will you please tell me what Senator Dole's <laughs> problem is? Uh, all the services sound great on the highway, but I'm told it, it must be paid for by. Um, uh, a home subscription fees that could cost uh, over $500 a month. That wouldn't happen, so how will it be paid for? Well, as I mentioned before, Americans are paying about $2,000 a year now in the average household for services that we can describe legitimately as coming over the information highway. Uh, this number is about twice as high as it was 10 years ago. Uh, it is certainly true, however, that if uh, businesses offer these products and services at uh, significantly high prices, they're just not going to find any customers. Uh, how, are, uh, how are those people who want to participate uh, in these businesses uh, going to be best motivated to offer their products at the lowest possible prices? I think you must know that my answer is competition. Uh, it is competition that is going to stimulate uh, the kind of rivalry among businesses that makes sure that prices get down as low as possible uh, and much, much lower than any number like $500 a month. That's uh, far, far too high. Can I clarify my question? Uh, that's hard to do on the television, and we can't pick that up. If you could pass it up, uh, please, so it, otherwise they can't ca pick you up on uh, public radio and they get mad at me. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you could pass up your We could repeat his question. question if he uh, hollers it Okay, yeah, you want to go ahead. We should this is very unorthodox. I get to clarify my answer too. <laughs> well, he's coming up there. Uh, if PCS uh, takes a share of residential market, will the PCS also be required to bear the cost of universal service for common carrier? Yes, it's extremely important uh, that as the different networks uh, compete to provide services uh, they all should bear an appropriate uh, burden of guaranteeing universal service for all Americans. It can't be the case that uh, the wire network is the only one that has to bear that burden of providing the funds necessary to maintain universal service. It has to be that there's a level playing field for competition. Quickly, we've got to get air here. <laughs> Did you pick up that? And can you? Uh, is the uh, the question is um, is the FCC? I'm summarizing it here. Is the FCC uh, fit and capable of taking on the various burdens that would be delegated to it under the legislation that I uh, just mentioned? Uh, the FCC is about 2,000 people. Uh, 
we were about 2,200 people uh, more than 10 years ago when the size of the economy that we have any responsibility over uh, was uh, less than a half, closer to a third of what it is now. Uh, and I have said that we uh, need some more people. We don't need many more people, but we need uh, a few more people. However, I can't say enough about the dedication and the talent uh, and the commitment of the people who are at the FCC. They are great public servants. Uh, they understand uh, what it takes to fulfill the public interest. Uh, and I hope that the legislation passes and that we get the chance to uh, do what it asks us to do. Okay, uh, we're about out of time here. Before asking the last question, I'd like to present you with this certificate of appreciation for being here, which you thank you very much, Joe. Put up there in your, uh, over your telephone, <laughs> and a uh, National Press Club mug. Oh, the mug! Not the, the mug, yeah. <laughs> That mug has gotten a lot of abuse this year. <laughs> this very mug? Not that particular oh. mug, though. <laughs> <laughs> and the last question is, first of all, for all you uh, people out there on our connected to our information superhighway, we do have audio and videotapes. Can be called by using your personal uh, telephone computer service here. 1-800-500-9911. Now the question is, is there not a limit on how much information anyone wants? Is it possible that we are creating a huge in industry to provide information and everyone would rather be out watching a ball game? Uh, I love baseball. Uh, but the uh, honest answer is that it's what uh, competition ought to give us the answer to this question. Uh, the businesses ought to try to sell their wares and build these systems and consumers ought to have the choice in deciding whether to buy them or not. Um, the economy will best be best off if competition answers that question and if I don't. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really nice. Appreciate that. Thank you very much and that concludes our program for today. Editor of Telecommunications Reports. Al Warren, editor and publisher, Warren Publishing. Janine Aversa of the Associated Press. <laughs> and her husband out in the audience there. Uh, Brian Lamb, uh, chairman and chief executive officer of C SPAM. Mary Crowley, executive editor, Education Technology News. Blair Levin, Chief of Staff, to Mr. Hunt. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, we have Christy Wise, freelance journalist and chairwoman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Karen Watson, Director of the Office of Public Affairs at the Federal Communications Commission. Ken DeLecky, Editor of Kiplinger's Florida Business Letter and the member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Uh, Mark Lewin of Business Week. Uh, Kim McAvoy, uh, Washington Bureau Chief for Broadcasting and Cable Magazine. Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Gil Klein. I'm the president of the club and a national correspondent for Media General Newspapers, writing for the Richmond Times Dispatch, the Tampa Tribune, and the Winston-Salem Journal. In deference to full disclosure, and in light of our speaker, I should add that Media General also holds the cable franchises in Fairfax County and uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Not that that should do anything about uh, what you say here. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome the club members in the audience today, as well as those of you watching us on C-SPAN, or listening to this program on National Public Radio, or the Global Internet Computer Network. Before introducing our head table guests, I would like to remind you of some of our upcoming speakers. On Wednesday, May 4th, Howard Baker, former senator and chief of staff to President Reagan, 
will discuss u s companies doing business in the former soviet union the light and microwave transmission mr hunt has already made it clear that he is not going to take a passive role his first major initiative was to order cable television rates cut by seven percent consumer advocates lauded the action but critics said it crippled the cable industry's ability to raise money to build the information superhighway in the wake of his decision the bell atlantic's twenty six billion dollar merger with telecommunications collapsed but whether this there was a cause and effect is debatable mr hunt's f c c has levied heavy fines for offensive language by shock jock howard stern and he defends the agency's right to regulate broadcast content if it's deemed to be in the public interest that worries some defenders of the first amendment before coming to this job mr hunt built a successful communications law practice in washington and los angeles that certainly may have warranted his appointment but mr hunt also had an uncanny ability to make the right friends at an early age in a speech entitled the new russian revolution uh, on uh, Wednesday, May 11th, Senator Bill Bradley, Democrat from New Jersey, will talk about violence in America. And on Thursday, May 12th, Kim Dae-jung, a uh, South Korean elder statesman, will present a speech entitled, The Road to Asian Democracy, North Korea, Asia, Asian Trade, and Other Issues. Transcripts and audio and videotapes of this luncheon are available by calling one 800 500 nine nine one one if you have any questions for our speaker and i certainly trust that you will please write them on the cards provided for you at your tables and pass them up and i will ask as many as time permits i'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask, ask them to stand briefly when their names are called please withhold your applause until all the names are read from your right is lou perlman a freelance journal and author of schools out a book about the multimedia revolution. Next to him is John Alden, a citizen. And finally, Ted Hearn, Washington Bureau Chief of Multi-Channel News. Now you can applaud. <clears throat> also, I'd like to thank staff members Melissa Bender, Pat Thornsbury, Melanie Abdow Dermont, and Jeff Tarbell for organizing today's luncheon. Now, until recently, we might have introduced our speaker today, Mr. Reed Hunt, as the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. But now, at the dawn of the age of interactive communications, we call him the top cop on the inter information superhighway. There are those who compare what's going on in the communications business with the Louisiana Purchase or the great post-Civil War railroad expansion. Vast new territories are opening up and billions of dollars can be made. The FCC stands as the gatekeeper of a wide array of rapidly changing technologies, broadcasting, cable television, cellular and conventional telephone, satellite.